I'm Dr. Nathaniel Chin, and you're listening to Dementia Matters, a podcast about Alzheimer's disease. Dementia Matters is a production of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Our goal is to educate listeners on the latest news in Alzheimer's disease research and caregiver strategies. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back to Dementia Matters. Today I'm joined by another key speaker from the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute's 20th Annual Update in Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementias Conference, Dr. Elizabeth Bacovey. Dr. Bacovey is an assistant professor in the Geriatric and Palliative Medicine Division at the Medical College of Wisconsin and Frederick Hospital in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. She's also the medical director for the Lutheran Home and Congregational Home and a practitioner at the Clement J. Zablocki VA Medical Center. Her work focuses on advanced care planning and dementia education, as well as end-of-life care, which was the topic of her WAI annual update presentation, Difficult Conversations Around Palliative Care, this past November. Dr. Bacavi, welcome to Dementia Matters. Thanks, Dr. Chen. Happy to be here. So you are a geriatrician and a palliative care physician. What led you to pursue training in both fields, and how do they best complement each other in the work that you're doing? So I have always loved older adults. I've always known that that is what I wanted to focus on. I volunteered in a memory care in high school, and then before medical school, I actually took a year off and then spent time at a nursing facility and doing certified nursing assistant work. So once I figured out that I could only work with the older population and that I could even further do just nursing facility care, I knew that this was really where I was gonna be and I've been sold and never looked back. The palliative care piece came just from one of those light bulb moments with a family interaction and it was just one of those things that I knew I had to do with this additional fellowship to really ensure that the way they complement each other is not only can I take care of somebody's loved one who is older, but also when they come into my nursing facility, then they know that I can take care of them from the moment that they enter the door throughout their entire life, no matter how long that life is. It's incredible that in high school, you knew not only, oh, I wanna be a doctor, but you knew the exact specialty in the exact setting that you were going to be working. Yeah, I just, just one of those things. I just always knew older adults is, is what I wanted to spend my life doing. And yep, never looked back, especially in the nursing homes. I just always knew that was my place. Oh, that's wonderful. And of course, we need care. We need providers like you in those nursing homes. So your talk at the WAI annual update was on difficult conversations around palliative care. Now, in my experience, people often have the wrong or incomplete idea of what palliative care is. So I'm hoping you can describe palliative care for us and how it differs in particular from hospice care. Sure. It is kind of uh, sometimes a nebulous term that is thrown around. So I'll try to describe it in a couple of different ways, and hopefully one of them sticks for the listeners. So At the simplest level, palliative care has been rooted in the hospice movement. However, unlike hospice, you don't have to have a terminal or a near-death condition. And you can think of it as a special service for any age and stage of somebody's illness. And it can be done in addition to potential curative treatments. So that's like the simplest way you could look at it. It's kind of this a little bit of a gray zone in between curative treatments, management with a a doctor and certain appointments. And you have this thing, this diagnosis, you have dementia or the beginnings of dementia. We know it's going to get worse. We're not there yet. And so how do we make that time good quality time? And that's kind of where palliative focuses um, and not the now we're near death, now we're talking about hospice. So it's that middle range. And for different illnesses, you know, for dementia, that palliative care range could be an involvement, could be much larger and a longer um, relationship with those providers. For a medical community, you know, it's a newer specialty. We just got into our training and board certifications at around 2006, 2007. So we're a newer specialty when you think of different heart specialists, brain specialists, things like that. 
it's usually a team approach. So the benefit of palliative care is that there's a lot of different people that are focused on somebody's quality of life. So you can have clergy members, social workers, case managers, you have a physician or an advanced care provider, psychologists, sometimes you can have music thanatologists uh, or music therapy. So there's a lot of holistic whole body support that comes with palliative care. Sometimes we get questions of, well, where is palliative care? And really palliative care should be provided in any setting because somebody's quality of life is always important no matter where they're at. So Palliative care can be on the inpatient. So if people are admitted to the hospital, there is a, usually a palliative care team. There's outpatient appointments, so you could go to a clinic. There is some home-based palliative care programs that are usually rooted in a home care agency or a hospice agency. So there's some you know, different levels, but also any provider that you have, you can ask them to talk about some of these bigger picture ideas and somebody's quality of life. If we dive into it a little bit deeper, you know, really a palliative care provider can focus on difficult treatment symptoms due to somebody's underlying illness and engage in some of those what we would call difficult medical decision. And in the medical community, we would use the term goals of care. And we really just think of that with our patients and our family members as those really difficult conversations where we talk about the big picture. We really try to support patients and families and try to provide anticipatory guidance to them as their illness progresses and also try to help with making plans for the future. So there, there's so much that palliative care does. And, and it, what your answer highlights so much of what I try to explain to my patients, which is it's not that we're giving up. It's not that we're doing less. In fact, it's the opposite. We're involving more people, more teams, thinking outside of the box in this holistic manner to treat conditions, to treat symptoms, to think about the future, and that it can be actually more intensive than what people think, meant there to be person-centered, but whole whole person. And so I appreciate your answer and also that it's in, it's in every context, every setting. You can be in a hospital, it can be at home. But it is for serious conditions in, in, in general. If, you know, if you're a healthy individual, you wouldn't necessarily need palliative care, but it is sort of also an approach. You know, it's an approach to how we we provide care? I like to say it. it's a lot of the art of medicine rather than some of that science and guideline of medicine. So it's really, it's, we're not looking at, you know, really somebody's lab work and all that kind of stuff. We're talking to the person, seeing how they are able to function, seeing how they are able to think and express themselves and trying to figure out what makes that life quality life and trying to help people talk through, well, if this is what somebody's quality of life is, then these are the treatments moving forward that seem to make sense to either maintain that quality of life or try to improve it. So then what does palliative care offer people living with dementia more specifically? Because dementia can be such a long illness. And, you know, in the beginning, if somebody's diagnosed with dementia, you know, advanced care planning and these kind of discussions about quality of life and what makes their life quality and how we can maximize that quality for as long as possible. So having those discussions when our loved ones with dementia are still able to express their wishes, potentially, you know, we're not taking away care, we might just be transitioning care. So discussions about putting potential limits to care when it doesn't seem to make sense or benefit somebody's quality of life. I always like to ensure proper paperwork is in place. So talking about a power of attorney, if anything financial needs to be done, not that us as a medical provider does that, but giving that recommendation and, um, you know, having the discussion about code status, about if somebody would like to be a full code or do not resuscitate and having those discussions about what that means, not only for their body, but also for their brain and chances after somebody does have a CPR event. And also talking about going to and from the hospital anymore and maybe Somebody, when you're talking to them in the beginning, still has benefit of going to the hospital. At some point, they may say, if I get to this point, whatever that point is for them, I no longer want to go back and forth to the hospital. So some of those big pictures are helpful to kind of address when our loved ones with dementia can actually express those wishes. And so on this podcast, we talk a lot about those clinical syndromes of dementia, mild cognitive impairment. And so I want to know what you think about palliative care, perhaps even earlier than dementia, in this whole spectrum of cognitive change. 
is there a place for it with someone who has mild cognitive impairment, but it's due to a progressive condition like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease or Lewy body disease? I think there is. And for some of the same reasons that I just touched on about making sure the proper paperwork is in line. And the other thing is that it's such a big responsibility and a job to be somebody's power of attorney. I've been asked by family members and I say, I will do this for you, but we're going to sit down and have a conversation about what you want done in certain big picture situations. So when somebody has mild cognitive impairment, it's that perfect time of getting that information in line, getting it to all your medical professionals, but also you as a power of attorney or a caregiver knowing you know, not just that that paperwork is there, but what that paperwork means and how you can best advocate for your loved one as their dementia progresses. So I think for MCI, that's really a big piece of it. For somebody that has, well, really anything, Alzheimer's dementia, Parkinson's or Lewy body, um, specifically with Parkinson's disease that progresses to dementia too, is that there's going to be a swallow aspect of it. And we all see our loved ones with Parkinson's disease develop a wet voice, issues with swallowing, and risk of having lung infections or pneumonias. And somebody that has Alzheimer's disease, they may forget how to eat appropriately and not be able to swallow appropriately. And so in the beginning, doing discussions about would you want a certain modified diet? Because for some people, food is quality of life. So asking if that is something that they would ever accept. And then talking about if you get repeat pneumonias because you can't swallow, and unfortunately, it's because of your brain you can't swallow, is there a point when we wouldn't want, when you wouldn't want to go back and forth to the hospital? So I think you have to add in that specific swallow piece, really with all dementias, because we know that it's likely going to happen to everyone at some point. So that's an important piece to put in there as well. Many people with serious medical conditions will ask their provider, how long do they have left to live? And this question becomes even more prominent when they have a condition like dementia. So how do these conversations go with you and how accurate do you think providers are in giving estimates? I'll start with that last bit of the question and we are not accurate. Um, I think we all want to be, and we all wish that there was some science of medicine. We wish there was some really good guideline that we could check some boxes and figure out this is when our loved one is expected to die from their illness. We really don't have those. This is the at, that art of medicine again, where we look at somebody and we say, well, because our loved one isn't getting up, they're not eating, they're not as alert, things like that all those little things are meaning that we may be nearing our dying time. However, we're, we're just not very good at saying what that time looks like. I find that we get much better when time is closer. So when somebody is very near their dying time, something like hours to days, providers are very good at saying that. However, beyond that, sometimes there's a gray period where we as providers have a hard time saying this, your loved one is somewhere in weeks or months or maybe even many months to to years. We're not good at kind of breaking that part down. When I'm talking about this conversation with patients, you know, I I always tell them that I'm going to be honest with them. And I try to, what I would call, give them a, a warning shot and really just say that to our my patients and their family members that we're going to talk about some hard things. And is that okay with you? And by doing that, it gives them the chance to kind of mentally prepare that this is going to be a hard conversation. And also if there are people in the room that maybe would they would not want there, sometimes there's grandchildren or neighbors or people that aren't really involved in the medical care. It gives them a time to kind of look around the room and say, I'd like this person to leave, or I'll ask, is it okay with these people in the room? So it gives them that opportunity to prepare and also make sure the people they want in the room are there. And I would say that for the most part, everybody says yes, that they are ready and that they want to know their own prognosis. And really when I'm talking about it, I try to start by asking how much they have heard about their medical illness and how are they feeling about it? And that kind of gives me a good grounds for figuring out where we're at. So if I'm talking with a loved one who says, mom does not have a quality of life anymore. She's no longer able to respond with her environment around her. She's barely able to eat what she loved. 
that's a much different conversation about prognosis because then we can really get right into where we're at as far as time versus if somebody does not seem to have a good knowledge of where their where their loved one is at, then sometimes we have to do a little bit of catch up with giving some information. When I'm giving somebody prognosis, I always do a range. And again, I'll ask, like, has anybody ever talked to you about prognosis? Most people say no. And when I ask if they would like to know prognosis, most people say yes. I think there's only been two times where somebody's ever said, no, I don't want to know what my time is. Or depending on somebody's ethnic background, they may say, please tell a different family member. I don't actually want to know. So, and then we go into what the range of time is. And I always do a range because you're always going to have that person who wants to put it in a calendar and mark the day that that you have given. So I always do a range. I talk about hours to days or long days to short weeks. I'll talk about long weeks to months or maybe several months. And I'll always say too that, you know, I don't have a crystal ball and that people surprise me either way. Sometimes they die sooner or sometimes they die after the estimated time that I give. I also try during this time to add some anticipatory guidance for what families can expect because you could give this range, but if they don't know what they're looking for with their loved one, then it's not as helpful. So I do try to give families some anticipatory guidance about what dying time looks like and how we know that dying time is getting closer. So I'll talk with them about breathing changes or skin changes, changes in their cognition or their function. And we'll also talk about um, what that means as far as somebody's eating and drinking. And then I'll take usually take it a step further and say how we use medications for comfort to ensure that that dying time or that near dying time is as comfortable as possible for their loved one. That is a very comprehensive and intense discussion. And I'm glad you shared all the details because these are things that I'm not aware of. And I've been having these conversations or similar conversations for, for years. I am surprised that people don't want to know. Or there, are, there are very few people who don't want to know that most people do want to know what their prognosis is. And I think as a clinician, that's important to hear because that's probably something we're not really sharing um, because of our own discomfort in being able to give that information. So having a, a layout like you've done is very helpful. So far, I think for our clinicians that are listening, that, that's a very helpful way of, of, of presenting it. It kind of leads into my next question, which is another difficult part of the conversation, because an important component when talking about future care planning is to talk about code status, and you alluded to this earlier. And, then, and that's a medical term, it can be technical, but it's also really important to the person and the families and certainly to the healthcare system, particularly inpatient if you're in a hospital. How do you approach the conversation of code status? In, and what do you think are important things for people to know about code status before talking to their provider? Um, so I try to make it a conversation. I really try to paint a picture for families so that they know that we can do a lot of things up until somebody's heart and lungs stop and they are considered to have died. And then also talk about if they choose to have a full code status, what that means for potential success rates and what a recovery afterwards could look like for their loved one. And so I always wanna make sure that at what is included with a do not resuscitate and a full code. So, you know, we always, I will always say that we try to prevent someone's heart and lungs from stopping, you know, our goal as medical providers, and that we can treat infections with antibiotics, we can provide fluids, we can give oxygen, medications, and try to treat heart attacks and strokes. So all of those things are usual medical care as long as that aligns with somebody's wishes. And I always say that it includes going back and forth to the hospital. So just because somebody is a do not resuscitate doesn't mean that it's no treatment or no hospitalizations. And then I'll say that despite these interventions, if somebody's heart and lungs stop and they are considered to have died at that point, what would you or your loved one want done at that point? And we'll talk about if you want CPR or chest compressions, if you want shocking and to be placed on life support with a breathing machine in your lungs, that's called full code. If at the point that you are considered to have died and your heart and lungs no longer are working. And if you say, I would like a natural death at that point and not to do those things, that is what's called a do not resuscitate, do not intubate. I think sharing with 
patients and family members that there is a range of treatment options before somebody's heart and lungs stop is very important because people get scared that if they choose a do not resuscitate, that that means that anything that happens to them from now on, we're not going to manage or we're not going to treat. And that's absolutely not the case. We treat plenty of things for people that are do not resuscitate and also that they know that they do have the option to go back and forth to the hospital. People can be uncomfortable with the conversation. However, they really need to weigh the risk and benefits of any intervention that happens to them. You know, a heart doctor or a cardiologist would talk to you about the benefits of certain cardiac or heart medications, but that seems a lot less scary, except when we're talking about someone's heart and lung stopping. I mean, this is one of the most invasive procedures we're ever going to have done to our body or our loved one's body. And it feels weird because we're almost asking for consent or approval before we even know when this event is going to happen. However, it is one of the most important consent processes that we all have to think about and really weigh what makes sense for us in our bodies or our loved ones' bodies. And that people need to know that doing full code interventions does not treat somebody's underlying medical illnesses. That if they've had heart, lung, kidney, you know, any other multitude of issues, dementia, it is not going to cure those events. And in fact, somebody is going to come out of a successful code event in worse shape, both functionally and thinking and cognitively wise, especially in our older adult populations. Being a full code doesn't give us a new heart and lungs. It just makes the current heart and lungs that we have sicker and potentially more damaged. And now our brain is even more damaged because of the whole event. So that's just really important for people to know. Sometimes they don't think of the fact that it's not what we see on TV and that it's a really invasive process and that unfortunately the success rate for an older adult and you add older adult with dementia or other health illnesses, the success rate is incredibly low. And those that do survive, they have a multitude of cognitive and functional limitations that usually leads to them needing more and more and more support. So to end... We have a lot of listeners that are family members of people living with dementia or cognitive change. What conversations should or could they start having with their loved ones? And how do they initiate those conversations? It's a very hard conversation to have. And depending on your relationship with your loved one, it can make it even a more tenuous conversation. I recommend just talking with your loved one and saying, this is going to be a hard conversation. I know neither of us want to have it. However, this is going to happen to everyone at some point. And to be your best advocate, you know, as our mentation continues to decline, you know, as as our dementia progresses, we need, I need to talk to you about this. That's my personal way about it. You just ask and say, this is hard. I need to be your advocate. We need to have this conversation. And by having the conversations early on, you don't need to do the entire thing. You can start it. You can you know, give that warning shot of, hey, mom, dad, aunt, uncle, we need to have this conversation. Why don't we pick a time, 15 minutes down the line, and we're going to do part of the conversation. And so you can kind of break it up into chunks if you start it early enough. And again, like I said earlier that, you know, I want to make sure that any power of attorney documentation is done, that this is a great time when our loved ones are able to tell us what's important to us so we can be their biggest advocate um, as their dementia progresses. Getting any other trust, living will, any other legal documents or paperwork, all of those things taken care of is really important to try to have while our loved ones can tell us those things. You can also use home safety, depending on where our loved ones are living. That can be a very touchy conversation too, because so many of our family members and loved ones are very you know, fiercely independent and want to remain that way as long as possible. But this can be a time where you can say, hey, we're not there yet. However, we do need to talk about your driving in the future or your cooking safety or our rug safety or depending on where you live and what you're interested in, gun safety. All of those things are wonderful to have conversations about early on and make a plan. And they're hard conversations, but they need to be done. And the biggest thing is going to be asking what makes their life quality life. And that if and when that quality of life isn't able to be achieved or reached, what they would want done or not done to them at that point. Honestly, you don't need, as a family member, you don't need to go through every scenario. 
You don't need to say, if this, then this. If this infection, then this treatment. If you know your loved one's quality of life wishes and what that big picture is, and you tell the medical providers, we're able to then give you recommendations on what treatments make the most sense to either get or maintain that quality of life for your loved one. So talking about tube feeding or dialysis for somebody's kidneys or prolonged life support, you know, all of those things are great. And if you're able to do that, wonderful. But if you're not, and you're just able to say, my loved one would never want to get to a point where they couldn't interact with their surroundings or my loved one loved eating. And if they can't eat, they would not want to always be on a tube or something like that. So if you just know that big picture quality of life and share that with us as the medical professionals, we can help kind of navigate what that means as far as medical treatments in the future. And that's really what it all comes down to is just making sure that somebody's quality of life is maintained for as long as possible. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Bacovey, for your excellent presentation at WAI and, and the care that you're providing the community. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Dementia Matters. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Or tell your smart speaker to play the Dementia Matters podcast. Please rate us on your favorite podcast app. It helps other people find our show and lets us know how we're doing. Dementia Matters is brought to you by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It receives funding from private, university, state, and national sources, including a grant from the National Institutes on Aging for Alzheimer's Disease Research Centers. This episode of Dementia Matters was produced by Amy Lambright Murphy and Kaylin Rowerdink and edited by Hao Ming Meng. Our musical jingle is Cases to Rest by Blue Dot Sessions. To learn more about the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, check out our website at adrc.wisc.edu. That's adrc.wisc.edu. And follow us on Facebook and Twitter. If you have questions or comments, please email us at dementiamatters at medicine.wisc.edu. Thanks for listening.